The tank we're looking at this morning is probably one of the most interesting in the museum. It may not look it, it may not look very exciting, but in fact, it's the second production Sherman tank built. It was built by the Lima Locomotive Works in Ohio, and um, it was sent over to Britain as a sample in 1942. So the chances are it's the oldest surviving Sherman tank anywhere in the world, which is quite something. Now you can tell it's an early vehicle, partly from the suspension. Notice it's got the vertical volute suspension, which is typical of the Sherman tank, but the return rollers are directly above the suspension unit, um, rather like they are on the Grant, for instance. And that was done originally because that's the way they'd always done it. In fact, they found with the Sherman that the rollers were getting a bit too close to the track, so they moved them to the back and put springs in instead. But it's really more or less the same. It's just one way of identifying this tank. There are two other features peculiar to the tank, which are worth looking at when you get a chance. One is at the front, where there are two machine guns, or at least two holes for machine guns, I think there's only one gun in there now, sticking out the front. They're in addition to the ball-mounted machine gun, which is fitted to the co-driver, the lap gun, as they called it. But those two machine guns, which are more or less fixed, they had a limited amount of elevation, are there purely for the driver to fire. Heaven knows why he needed to do that, but they reckon they were the most accurate machine guns in the, um, the vehicle itself. The other thing is the sight. Instead of being a telescope, which you'd expect in most tanks, it's, it's at the top of the turret in a sort of periscope arrangement. And you can see it if you look at the tank from the front. It gives the gunner an unusual view of things, but it's supposed to be in parallax with the main gun. So it should give him an accurate fire. They generally fitted a machine gun to the, the commander's cupola as well, but that wasn't terribly popular. The British answer to attacking aeroplanes was to shut the lid, keep your head down and hope the plane flew away. The Americans would rather try and shoot it down, but that's typical. Um, but that's how it works. When this tank originally arrived in Britain, it had one of the shorter 75 millimeter guns, which was the M2 gun. This one, by this time, they'd changed it to an M3, which was the type of 75 millimeter gun normally fitted to the Sherman. You can always tell when it had the M2 gun in, the gun's not only shorter, it's got two counterweight collars around the muzzle. They're done to balance the gun because it's got a hydropneumatic stabiliser inside it, which really needs balancing out from the outside. With the M3, it's not so necessary. The gun's the same, the right weight and counterbalances. Otherwise, it's an ordinary M4A1. The characteristic features are the, um, the cast hull, which you'll only find on the M4A1 version of the Sherman. It's got a radial nine-cylinder petrol engine in the back, but it drives down to a five-speed synchromesh gearbox in the front. So you've got a drive shaft coming quite high up from the back of the tank to the front. And because of that, the tank's just that little bit higher than it needs to be, perhaps but it's a very effective tank. Now, the reason it's called Michael, the name was appointed in America in honor of Michael Dewar, who was the manager of British Timkin in the United Kingdom, but who'd been sent over to the States early in the war as the British leader of the tank sort of commission to Washington. And Michael Dewar, is the man the tank's named after. They cast these brass plates and stuck them on the side. Otherwise, the tank is basically an M4A1 Sherman, and we'll be looking at other versions of the Sherman later on. But this is the basic Sherman, and this is the tank from which all others were derived in many respects.